Hello everybody, MD Polo here. Thanks for joining me. Today we're going to be taking a look at the HK P7. It has been described by some as perhaps the best fighting pistol ever designed. It is amazing how for a pistol that was designed in the 1970s, the technology was so far ahead of its time. And to give it justice, we're going to spend some time in this video giving you some of the history behind it some of the technical aspects of it, and of course my views and opinion of it. But more than anything, I'd like to know if you own a P7, what your thoughts on it are, and please correct me if I'm a little bit off or way off in some of the data that I describe. I'd like to learn from you as much as I'd like to share information with you. The P7 is a good example of what a company like HK can do when they put their minds into designing and manufacturing a pistol in the best possible way they can without giving too much thought into the cost, what the marketing department might say, or the input from the salespeople of what the public might like. Just plain out, set out, let your engineers loose, and do the best pistol that you can. You've got the P7 in front of you, and let me go, before we start walking around it, let me go through some of the specs and get that out of the way. It's a 9mm, striker fired, with a capacity of 8 plus 1, it came with 2 mags, barrel length is 4.1 inches, the overall length of the pistol is 6.5 inches, the height is 5.0 on the nose, the width is 1.1 inches, and with the mag, but empty, it weighs 30 ounces. It is out of production, and you can find them, if you can find them, somewhere in between $2,000 and $3,000, depending on what comes with it, the, the condition, and the, whether it comes with the original box, like you see here, the cleaning kit, and the sort. So as I give you some of the history behind it, I'll let you walk around. I'll try to do this around the tripod and show you a bit about the pistol. These are not the original grips that came with it. I'll show you those as well. But the, this pistol was born out of the decision by the West German police to re-equip their, their police services. What they wanted to do is equip, with, equip them with an advanced 9mm service pistol and it was to replace their existing 7.65 millimeter Browning caliber weapons. If this was prompted after the Munich Massacre, Olympic Man Massacre of 1972. Now they had some strict requirements of what this fireman, firearm had to do, and it was as follows. It had to meet um, well, like I said, the following requirements. It was to be chambered in 9mm, 9x19 parabellum. It had to weigh no more than 35 ounces. The pistol dimensions could not exceed 180 by 130 by 34 millimeters. It should have muscle energy no less than 500J and a service life of at least 10,000 rounds. And by the way, before I go on, I just want you to know this pistol has been safety check and it has a mag in it and the mag has two snap caps. So where I left you off is that it had to have a service life of at least 10,000 rounds. The pistol also had to be fully ambidextrous and it, was, it had to be safe to carry with a loaded chamber but at the same time, able to quickly draw it and be ready to fire instantly. So after a competitive bid, the German police forces selected three different pistols into, as their new service weapons. And these were the Swiss Sig Sauer P225, which was designated as the P6, and two German designs, one being this, the P7, which was officially designated as the PSP, and the Walther P5. The P7, as you see it in front of you, was uh, started production in 1979, although it was designed in 1976. And then shortly after that, it was adopted by the German Federal Police's Counterterrorism Unit, the GSG-9, 
and also the armies, the German army special forces. So the P7 brought to the market several firsts that until then they had not been seen in any handgun of the time. And to start with, it was the squeeze cocker. So I play with the safety. So the gun is clear. So in order to fire the gun, you see the squeeze cocker here. The, the squeeze cocker had to be completely depressed in order to press it and then you could fire it. I'm not going to squeeze the trigger right now, but that's what you had to do. Now, some people called it the staple gun pistol because of this, but that was the only way that you can fire this pistol is by pressing the cocking lever. The minute you release it, the gun goes immediately into safe mode again. The squeeze cocker also serves as a slide release after the slide lo locks back. So it serves several functions, but it was the very first time that this type of safety device was introduced into a pistol. As you can tell by looking at the slide is that there are no external controls. There's another thing that made the pistol ahead of its time. The pistol is completely ambi. So you go, letting you take a look at it. The slide is stainless steel. And this particular example has, I don't know if the, this light is giving it, giving it justice, but it has a slight plum hue to it. I'm trying to move it around in the light and see if you can catch that. Now this is rare and it does not happen to all P7s. And this is something that uh, while I was doing research, it, I couldn't really get too much of a straight answer of exactly what causes the plum hue. But what I was able to find out is that it came from the difficulty in, in the bluing, in bluing the heat treated high quality alloy steel from which this gun is made from. So to blue plain unheated treated carbon steel is easy to get a nice deep blue black finish. But the way they did this one and the chemicals that were used to manufacture the bluing for this gun, that caused the, the, the plum color on it. If you know anything different, please let me know. I'd love to learn more. Another thing that is amazing about this pistol is how low the bore axis is. If you see how it fits into your hand and how low it actually is into your hand, look where the slide is in relation to my hand. Now when you shoot it, you think that you're going to get slide bite, but you don't. You may get a little bit dirty, but you don't get, you don't get any slide bite. So the, the bore axis is very low. The recoil goes straight into your, up your arm and it becomes a very, very soft shooter and just a beautiful gun to, to shoot. One of the things that the German police needed was a gun that was very safe to carry. So with, with a round in the chamber, the trigger is absolutely dead unless you squeeze the staple gun. Another thing that was a first, and it was used in other types of firearms, but first in a pistol, is that it has a gas retardation system. The P7 has a gas piston, delayed blowback system, which makes it a very soft shooting gun. For those that don't know what it is, the, there's a small hole. When you, if you, I'm not gonna disassemble this, but if you're gonna disassemble it and just look inside of the barrel, just ahead of the, of the feed ramp, you're gonna see a hole that goes down. And that hole at the bottom of the barrel, just ahead of the feed ramp, when you fire it, a lot of the gas that is under extreme pressure, instead of going out and causing the, the gun 
to flip back, flip, flip out, what it does is the, piss, the gases go down into the chamber and there's a gas cylinder that absorbs some of that recoil. So it was a very advanced concept of his time to have the gas just come down and help in the reduction of the recoil. So the, re the inertia of the slide was greatly reduced by this system. Again, very much advanced on his time. Now that's a, this is a system that as far as I know has not been used again since this pistol until Walther came out with a CCP. So the Walther CCP has a very similar system as the HKP7. So again, if I didn't explain that correctly, or if you know better than I, of course, how this works, please sound it off in the comments below. I'd be very happy to learn. Another first that came with this gun, as you can see, is a, it has a three-dot system, sight system. And this was the first time that a three-dot system was um, shown on a pistol. So let me take and see if I can focus this and give you a closer look at the sights. Of course, they're not night sights, they're not fluorescent, there's just a plain three-dot sight system. Moving down on the gun, sorry about the pause, I was just letting you look at it. Moving down at the gun, through the gun, now you're gonna see the grip and the grip angle. This is another thing that was a first and was very well thought of. As you can see, the grip is not too far back, it's actually moved forward into the frame. This does two things. Number one, it created a slight beaver tail so your hand can get deep into the gun, but also the angle of, this, of the grip here is 110 degrees. So this, I, I read this somewhere too, and I'm not sure where I read it, so proper credit for whoever wrote this. I apologize, I don't have a, a source. But what they were saying is that if you grab your hand and you point with your index finger, that that angle is 110 degrees. So this angle is 110 degrees as well, which makes it a very naturally pointed gun. So 110 degrees there. Now the mag, and these are not the original grips, we'll go through the grips as well, but these are just beautiful wood grips. I can let you look at the other one. Now, while we're down here, let me show you that there's the beginning of texturing that was also shown here in the P7. So you see that this part of the gun is nice and smooth, but the front part of here of the grip, it does have rougher texturing. It's not rough, it doesn't stick out. It's just more coarse than what you would see around the other part of the gun. And you see that same type of texturing in the back of the grip. I'm trying to find an angle where you can see that a little bit better. So you can see up here is smooth, and down here you see the change in the texture that goes all the way back. At the bottom here, you're gonna find the mag release is at the heel right here, so making it automatically ambi. And while I have it out, here's the mag. It's eight rounds, metal mag. It's got a snap cap. And as you can see, when you insert the mag, it does not follow the 110, sorry about the focus, it does not follow the 110 degree. So you've got the angle of the grip here at 110 degree, but the mag is kind of straight almost vertical. And the reason this was done is that it presented a much more natural and reliable angle of feed of the round of the bullet into the chamber. It did not have to mess with an angled mag and then trying to pop the bullet into the chamber. But it was straight because the barrel is fixed. So it's not a browning design type of barrel where it angles up, it is a fixed barrel. So with a straight angle here and this in the horizontal here and vertical here it gave it a very natural feed and very reliable it also does not have a mag disconnect safety 
which was popular in its time, HK refers it as the sitting duck effect, in which you will not be able to fire your weapon if the mag was out and in the middle of reloading you were a sitting duck. So that was something that was important for HK and for the German police not to have the sitting duck effect. You've got nice serrations. Going back to the slide, you've got nice serrations. They're sharp, but not too sharp where they're going to hurt you. They're just very nicely done. And of course, I think there's a fire truck going off in the background. I don't know if you can hear it or not. There were two other versions of the P7. And the P7 M8 was designed for the US market. And what that had was, instead of having the mag release, at the heel like this does, it had it in the it has it in the regular position where you you would find for the US market, where the US uh, consumer is used to having it. And after that, the M13, the P7 M13 came out, it has a wider body because it accommodates a mag that can hold 13. So you got a 13 plus one and the other two were eight plus one. This is an eight plus one was the first model. This particular gun has been fired very little as you see. Now one thing that most people don't know and a lot of you, even P7 owners don't know is that you see that little button right there. That little button helps you lock the slide back if you want to do it manually without having to either do it because the mag is empty, you just finish firing and then it'll lock on its own, but you can also do it manually by pressing this little button right there. And then this other button back here, this is for the takedown for the field strip of the, of the gun. It actually takes down, I'm not gonna do it here, this gun belongs to my friend David, so I should have thanked him at the beginning. Um, he's the same friend that lent me the model, the Smith & Wesson Model 52 that we reviewed last week. But to take this, down, this gun down, you would just simply sl push the slide back a little bit, like the Glock, press the button, and then the thing comes apart. Looking at the barrel, or talking about the barrel, because I'm not gonna, like I said, I'm not gonna disassemble it. It is pretty big for the size of this pistol. Like we said, it's, um, it's a little bit over four inches, actually 4.1 inches, and it's called hammer forged barrel with polygonal rifling. This is another first for the P7, because the polygonal rifling, although it had been used in other types of weapons before this, it had been it never been used before in a handgun. So there you go, another first for the P7. The trigger is very smooth and predictable. It's got a wide trigger for the size of the pistol. Let's see if you can how much the camera will cooperate there. As you can see, it's got serrations along the shoe and it's pretty wide and very comfortable. It, it is um, consistent in pulling somewhere between four and a half and five pounds pretty much every pull. The trigger guard is ample, but not too big, with serrations in the front if you were to need them. Now, like I said, the original grips are just regular polymer grips. They go along here, they're black, but this has the upgraded nail grips. And I think it just gives it a much better look to the pistol. Now, what are some of the negatives of this of the P7? Well, it is extremely it was ex extremely expensive to manufacture and difficult to maintain. It is not recommended that anybody does a complete disassembly of this gun because the system is very complicated and difficult to be put back together. It's easy to feel strip, but if you need it to put it all apart, it's very difficult. The mechanisms inside are complicated. And then other negative that I found is that if you fire it a lot, it gets pretty hot due to the, uh, the gas cylinder gets very hot. So to wrap it up, I'm trying to not keep it very long and there is so much technical information about this gun that this video could end up being a 40 minute video. What I'd like to do is open it up for comments below. Teach me what you know about the P7. I'd love to know if you own, a, own one, what your thoughts are, and please correct me on anything that I may have misquoted. Now, what do you think? Is this the best pistol ever made for self-defense? In my opinion, it is incredibly accurate. 
it's easy to control, it's reliable, and it is extremely safe. I read somewhere that this is the pistol that James Bond should have carried all along. That this pistol is James Bond. So once again, um, wherever that quote came from, proper credit to them, that is not my quote, but I completely agree with it. So let me know what you think. Is this the best pistol ever made for self-defense? Thank you for watching. Thank you for sticking through this with me. And until the next time, God bless.